small room. So Bluffton, uh, like so many little towns, had become a ghost town. Uh, tell us where it is ago, the only thing you could buy in Bluffton was a postage stamp. No business, no, no business at all other than a little seasonal peanut buying plant over there. When we made the decision to change the way we farm, we, the, the, we made some very intentional decisions regarding land management and, and how we did the animal management. That was very intentional. We, we, we knew what we had been doing. We studied up on what we thought we ought to be doing. We implemented changes. Some of them worked, some of them didn't. The ones that didn't, we we changed. Some, we went back and changed it, and we finally got it. Or we're still getting it to, what, to the, the way we want it. Uh, the the deal with the town was different. Uh, we, we we never said, I believe we can improve the town. That was never a consideration. Uh, you know, I, I, I wasn't, you know, I knew how much money I did not have, and I never thought we could make an impact. But when we brought all these people here from New Jersey and everywhere else in the country, and paid them reasonably well, and, they, and, the, and the kind of people we brought are smart, passionate, educated, energetic people, and they need a place to eat and sleep and play and shop, and we built it, and they, they came. That's the old courthouse, that's my office. That's the old Methodist church. This old other business in Bluffton, this is where we bring in the feed, the non-GMO feed for the, for the monogastrics. We, if we don't feed uh, any grain or any supplement to our cows, sheep, goats, but we do feed a non-GMO feed from the Saka Sun Mill here in Georgia to the uh, pigs and poultry. They bring, the, bring it in here on semis and we load it onto our little trucks and tractors and take it out to the field. We started aggressively buying houses and lots and storefronts in this town about 15 years ago. Because when they sell, Nobody wanted to buy them. We just bought them so cheap that uh, it, it really wasn't even good business because uh, I'd, I'd pay $500 for a lot. But if I had to sell it the next day, I had to sell it for 400 because, and it didn't generate any income. So, it, But I'm glad we did. I, I just, it just seems foolishly cheap, so I bought them. And I'm glad I did. We, we don't own all of them. We own a lot of them. At least uh, these houses, these next three houses are ours and a lot of these storefronts. We, we, and I, I really think that uh, Bluffton has moved from being a, a ghost town to a little destination. I like where it is. My, my, I got two daughters that work here and their spouses. And then they, between the two of them, they got three grandbabies. And it's just a real good place to raise children. When I, when I was growing up here, it was a good place to raise to be raised. You know, I could, I could ride my bicycle to Bluffton to get up an offense-defense football game any Saturday afternoon I wanted to. And then when my children were growing up, it was a ghost town. And now my grandchildren growing up, it's, it's kind of back to the party. And I think that's very nice. This is where uh, we make uh, our Tyler products like candles and soap and those kind of things. That's the, that's the boss lady right there. <laughs> Looks like she's unloading my grandson. I said, okay, getting something out the back. Uh, they are uh, tallow products, lover products, uh, raw, rawhide, pet chews, pet treats. Uh, we were able to monetize a lot of things we used to throw away. It says sun-dried leather. Uh, you don't have to use any chemicals or anything? No, I don't think it's what I said. Uh, uh, Sun-dried sun is the uh, rawhide oh, okay. for pet shoes. Yeah. The lover, we send it to a tannery. We send it to actually two tanneries. One does vegetable tanning that's real nice. The other one does chrome tanning, which I hate, but if they have like rugs and all, that's what you do. This is uh, 
a bunch of pigs in here. We raise the hogs in the woods. I'll show you where we do it. Of course, they don't respect the electric fence. So when we wean them, we bring them up here and put them in this hard wire enclosure so the pigs learn to respect the electric fences. Then we can put them back out. That's a, that's a training center. Uh, we have an appetite to build houses now. Uh, not, not the kind of houses you sit there, big Victorian houses, but little tiny, tiny homes. But I got a little problem. Uh, Bluffton has city water, but not city sewage. So we, we, we can't put many because we have to do drain fields. And I'm petitioning the EPD now to let me uh, have gray water run off and then use compost and toilets, which I can put a lot of density in again, but they don't want to do it. So we we in a little contest right now. This is our fall calving herd of cows. There was, a, there was 1,024 females in that herd, and uh, they rotate from pasture to pasture. You, uh, so this is where they are now. We put them out there this morning. You'll be able to see where they're going to go tomorrow morning, and you'll see where they came from. You can see uh, moving animals every, uh, is, is essential. Uh, uh, these cows move every day. Uh, poles are moved about once a week. Hogs about once a month, maybe a little. That's situational how much impact they're making on the land. We love to put hogs in places like this, scrub. There's, a, there's enough lights to run a Christmas tree on the back of this. So yeah. There's hogs in these woods here. They're for, uh, sows farrowing over here right now. The uh, We got basically three herds of cattle. That, that that changes a little bit, but basically there's three herds of cattle. There's this fall calving herd here that we put uh, uh, bulls, we turned the bulls in February 15th. The calves come about Thanksgiving, 283 days. The uh, summer calving herd is a smaller herd, is uh, less than 400 and something, less than 500 in it. We turn the bulls out August 15th, so they come the end of May. And then the uh, bull herd was our fat cat. Uh, that's, that's finishing. We do all the finishing down here on the home place that's got 5% organic model. I can't, I, can't, I can't finish cattle on this land that's not in good shape. Mama cows up here on this. Uh, I don't, uh, the herd has been a closed herd on the female side since 1866. My, my great granddaddy brought cracker cattle here in 1866 and, and kept his own bulls and heifers. Uh, at some point, I don't know when it was, my granddaddy started buying purebred bulls to improve the herd. My daddy did and I did. Between the three of us, I bet you we've had at least one of every breed of bull that's ever been to Georgia, from Brahman to Akayushi to Hereford to Angus, you name it, we, we probably had one. And we mongrelized the hell out of them in doing that. And uh, uh, about six, eight years, probably eight years ago, I quit uh, castrating bulls to get a high animal welfare rating. And when I did, I realized I was raising better bulls than I was buying. So I, now I save my own bull. This is not mine. This is that big chunk, 700 acres I showed you that I don't own. This actually belongs to a cousin of mine who's retired. And he rents it to a farmer that farms with corn, cotton, peanuts. And it's, uh, it's, it's a half percent organic model. And, when it, when it rains, the water coming off of it looks like a strawberry milkshake. And, you know, it, it is what it is. Uh, you know, I don't, it, it'll sell one day probably, and uh, I don't know if I can buy it or not. That's going to be a very expensive farm. It, uh, irrigated. I think that uh, non-irrigated land here sells for about $2,000 an acre. And I think that's underpriced.
<clears throat> so I try to buy it when I can, if it, if it touches me. Irrigated land, I think, is overpriced. It'll sell for five, six thousand dollars an acre, and I just can't afford. To, I can't. I can't afford to buy it. I, mean, I don't. I think this is sadly, this is it. I own all the way around. I own all the way around on three sides, but I don't own that. And it's just kind. Of, it's inconvenient. I mean, I, I, I can. It's moving cattle, having to go walk you know, around it. better and better, but 10-ish, probably, about 10. You know, and, and everything is rough. This is the home place. This is the, this is the home farm here that, that is 5% organic model. Tell, tell her to turn in, Tara. Tell her to turn in. Well, I'm so your biggest herd is the fall camping herd, right? Why isn't it more like a spring? Uh, I, I used to do all fall calving, but, and I, I just started moving. Eventually, they'll be the same size. Okay. I, I slaughter cattle 52 weeks a year, so I need calves coming all the time. If I have two herds with about a five-month breeding period, I used to be 60 days, but now five-month breeding period, I have calves right. all year. As long as you have calves in the fall and in the spring, you can you can butcher. If it's if I come over five months, you know, yeah, five months breeding period, so calving season is five months, oh, so twice they, a year. So they don't all all at one time. Because this business. So I, I got a producer group, twelve farmers that raise cows for me, but I'm I want to become less and less dependent on that.